You may be seated. Sorry about that. We had a little technical difficulty. The, the talk came off the stand. I think I'll leave the preaching to Daniel. We're just going to talk this morning. How's that? I want to thank Daniel for allowing me to share with you this morning. It's always a privilege to be able to come and share uh, from the Word with you and to be able to talk about things. Psalm 51 really is about prayer. Sounds like an innocuous kind of topic to talk about, but we're going to do it anyway. I want you to think about this. How important is prayer? Prayer is vitally important in the believer's life, even though that sounds like an understatement. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, very short, says, never stop praying. I'm going to encourage you that if you're tooling down the 303, don't close your eyes to pray. That would probably work out best for all of us. But we should have that attitude of prayer. We should constantly be in an attitude of prayer. Uh, long ago when I was in Bible college, you know, we'd tie the horse up out in front of the building and go in. I, I had a professor, Harold. He was a great man. Harold was the kind of guy who would tell you this. You know, we're going we're gonna to quote this verse. Uh, it's in Isaiah chapter 42, and uh, we'll start in the middle of the verse, and boom, off he'd go. And he would tell you. But he had a great, great thing about this, about prayer. Harold said, if we do not pray, we hold Christianity in theory only. And here's what he meant. How many of us here believe that Jesus is real? Okay, you can say, yay, <laughs> do that. How many of us believe that Jesus died and rose again? Yes. Amen. So why don't we talk to him? Why don't we talk to him more than we do? You see, prayer, if I believe that God is real, if I believe he is alive, if I believe he is everything about my life, why don't I talk to him more than I do? Well, there may be a reason for that. We'll take a look. But do we pray in all situations and seasons? Do we pray and expect things to be different? You know the definition of insanity? Everybody knows that, right? It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. If I want things to be different, I have to do something different. That's the way it works. It's not hard. It's not ma magical. It's just real. Do we pray and expect things to be different, or do we pray, if we pray, just to fulfill what we believe is a spiritual duty or an obligation, or maybe just to soothe my conscience? Oh, I should pray. Okay, I'll pray. It was once said that we as believers know how, however, to avoid praying about things we have no intention of acting upon. I just don't pray about those things. I like my life. I don't want it to change, so I'm not going to pray about it. I'm just going to go on with my life. If we seriously prayed for hungry people to be fed, we might end up skipping a few meals, as we might need to, and give that money to a local food pantry. Oh, that's real, isn't it? That's real. That's doing something. You really expect me to do something? I'm here, aren't I? Isn't that enough? So we have become master Christians at selective praying. We pray for the 
low-hanging fruit. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. We're masters at leaving out certain prayers that we have no intention on acting upon. So I want us to look at three areas of prayer that we leave out of our life too often. First of all, we leave out prayers about things we really don't want to change. In verses 7 through 9 of Psalm 51, he said there, he talks about being cleansed with hyssop. He would be clean, wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and so on and so on. You know, here's what I do know. It can be scary to pray about things that might change. It can be scary. I like my life. It's, and here's a word that oh, puts me on edge with Christians. It's comfortable. When did God ever call us to be comfortable? He called us to be edgy, living on the edge. But getting back, it can be scary to think about things and pray about things to change. Many of you know I'm from a state that many of you didn't even think existed, up in Maine, way up in the corner. I was telling the first service people, and this is true, I had a, someone ask me if that was part of the United States or was it part of Canada. And no, no, we're, we're here. I went from the oceans of Maine to the desert of Arizona. I don't know, it's a long story, here I am. Don't pray for change if you're not ready for it. What if God actually wants me to change what I'm doing, where I'm living, the career that I have? What if he says it's time to do something different? What if he says it's time to be in a different place, a different part of the world? We ready? I had friends that led, left the business world and ended up in South America as missionaries. That was a big change, huge change for he, them and their family. But I think there are equally or even more important things than jobs or houses or careers these will require a change inside us. And much about this is about changing me and not just my geography. In verses 7 through 9, as we read, the writer of the psalm is not referring to physical cleansing. He's asking for God to make him a new person. Look what he wants. He says, I want a new heart whiter than snow he wants a new start and here's the cool thing here's the cool thing it happens every morning his mercies are renewed on a weekly basis no nope. scriptures say his mercies are renewed every single morning i messed up today okay you got tomorrow or maybe not i don't know as I always say, life goes on until it doesn't. But he says every morning you get a second chance and a 222nd chance and a 2,000th chance to do it better. Every single day. He wants to be whiter than snow. He wants the joy to return. He wants his past sins to be forgotten. I can't tell you how many people are weighed down by what they used to be. I hear, hear that all the time. You don't understand what I used to be. I don't need to understand what you used to be. Because that's what you used to be. It's what you are now and moving forward that God cares about. All that you used to be, he said, ah, I took care of that. that, that that's gone. But you see, the writer says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. But you know, there's a problem here. The problem here, we like things the way they are, don't you? You know what you're going to do pretty much when you go home from here. We got one more week of football. You know, come on. 
I don't know what we're going to do after February, but we'll figure it out. You know what you're going to do. It's that word again, comfortable. I go home, you know, I have lunch, take a nap. I watch football or try to watch football and take a nap. I don't know. But here's the problem. It's going to be difficult to pray for people with no home while we have empty rooms. It's difficult to pray for our church to move forward and stay home on Sunday. It's difficult because there are more important things in our life, like that round of golf you got to get to, or the pickleball that you got to make it to. You see, we have things in our life and we like it that way. Change is not easy and it's scary. If we don't pray for things like this, there may be a reason. If, there's a re if, if we don't pray for us personally to change, maybe it's because I really don't want to change. And so I'm a master Christian. I just won't pray for it. That way I'll go, well, God never told me. Did you ask? Did you ask? Second area we leave out is prayers about the big questions. Starting in verse 10, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He goes on to talk about what the big things are. As believers, as human beings, we believe there are big questions in our life, don't we? One of the biggest questions you can think of, you don't need to say it out loud, but I want you to think about that for a minute. But we often think back, uh, for most of us, it was two or three years ago when we were 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were 18, there were huge questions. And I, I have often said, we ask 18-year-olds to make life-changing decisions before they've lived any life. How do you do that? But that's the way it is. Here's the big questions we think of. What will I do? What's going to be my career? Where will I live? In other words, where am I going to do what my career is? Who will I marry? Don't know. Who's that person that I'm going to build my life with? Will I marry at all? Or does God intend for me to be alone? Those are certainly big questions. They certainly are. But I think that bigger questions are still out there. I think there are much bigger questions than those. Some of you are thinking, are you out of your mind? Those are the biggest questions you can ask. Really? And that's the issue. We as believers think what we do physically is the most important thing in our life. God says what you do spiritually is the most important thing in your life. Don't believe me? Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first your career and housing. No. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom. And all that stuff will be added. All that stuff. That's what it is. It's stuff. Those of us in the room that are my age or older, aren't you starting to get rid of your stuff? I know Peggy and I do. We keep finding things and go, yeah, we don't need that anymore. And choo, out it goes. Call the kids, do you want it? No. So off to goodwill we go. See, we spend a lifetime worrying about stuff when God says seek the kingdom first. Then all your stuff will come along. See, we think the physical life goes first and our spiritual life comes dragging along behind it. 
When God says you put your spiritual life first and let the physical life come dragging behind it. That's the order and that's what we don't do because we're master Christians. We know how not to pray for the big things. We're more concerned with our physical life and what we get out of it rather than what we will carry into eternity. 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10, says this, Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Can you just see the wall of flames here and somebody come jumping through? They've lost everything, but they make it to the other side. Just barely. They make it. But boy, I'll tell you, those things done for ourselves, the wood, the hay, and the straw, it's going to go up in smoke. Just the way it is. Does that mean those things were all bad? No. No, not necessarily. I like living in a house. It's a choice we made. Better than a tent in the middle of the street. Really, really good. I like eating at least three times a day. I like that. So there are physical needs. But those things that we do, understand they're not kingdom. They're not kingdom events. Kingdom events are what we should focus on. Those things done for the kingdom, gold, silver, and precious stones, will stand as an eternal building before the Lord. Isn't that cool? That's cool. How much am I going to contribute to the building of the kingdom? That's a question every one of us should ask ourselves this morning. How much am I going to contribute? When the fire is done, will I have any gold, silver, and jewels to hand to the master builder and say, here, add this to the foundation, to the building? That's a question we all have to ask. What if there is someone who needs us? What if there is something I need to do we need to go back and re-examine what a truly big question is. If it isn't all of those other things, what are some big questions? Well, how about this? Would we dare pray for orphans and then actually open our home? Would we do that? Not everybody can or would, but someone would if you challenge. What if we were heading out for a night of fun? with your spouse or friends or whatever, somebody calls and says, you know, I really need to talk to you. Do I tell them, uh, you're going to have to go on without me because i got to go talk to this person? Or would you tell that person, oh, you know, I'm going out. Sorry. What if there was someone in real physical need, and let's make this interesting. Let's make this one a little interesting. There's someone in real need, and they're not someone you really like. There's some when you go, oh, you know. Do you know, Christians, we brighten a room, don't we? Christians brighten every single room. Some of us by coming in that room, and some of us by going out of that room. But we brighten a room every single time. So that, that person, you know, me, would you want to be ready and willing to give to that need? Because you have it? Ooh, that's a big question. In verses 10 through 12, as we saw, sorry, again, some technical difficulties. 
In verses 10 through 12, the writer asks God to create a pure heart. You know, purity in this, word, in this instance is the essence of doing right no matter the circumstances or the cost. That's purity. Purity says not only is there a big chance I'm not going to get anything back from this, there is definitely I'm not getting anything back from this, and it's going to cost me. I didn't plan on it costing me, but it's going to cost me. Time, emotions, money, whatever it might be. But purity says, I'm going to do it anyway. Because that's what God called me to do. The writer asks that the Holy Spirit rule in his life, which indicates that he is ready to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit in every single situation. Boy, that's hard. And don't tell me that you have considered every situation in your life until you've considered every situation in your life. Because God will point out what you haven't considered. I'll guarantee you. You see, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit. And then he says, restore the joy. Through his own willing spirit, restore the joy. But, are we even open to the concept I think we need to re-examine who we are in Christ and ask ourselves what questions truly are big questions. Last area that we leave out often is about who we would be and what we should accomplish. Starting in verse 13, Psalm 51 verse 13, it says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. And he goes on to talk about a few things there that kind of is a culmination of the first two areas. But it's about the results. This is about results, and it's often easier to not pray about results. Oh, God will do that. And that's true. Paul said, I watered, uh, Apollos watered, or I planted, Apollos watered. I get it right one of these days. But it was who that gave the increase? God. I understand that. But the first two things had to happen, didn't they? There had to be a planting, there had to be a watering, then God gave the increase. Well, you know, God will give the increase. Yeah, but did you plant? Did you water? Did you talk? Did you do anything? Oh, that's God. (laughs) So easy not to pray about the big things. But you know, it's often easier to live by the rules that everyone follows and to seek the same version of a good life that everyone wants, right? In our society today, following the rules and having a good life means we have a nice house, beautiful car, lots of possessions, money in the bank. That's a good life. Now, nothing wrong with that. Not at all. But here's what I'm saying. Is that your focus? Is that where your focus is? Because, you see, it's easy because that's what everybody else is doing. But you know what? Even in Christianity that happens. Here's what I mean. I read my Bible, little. I go to church most of the time. I'm looking out over the congregation today and it's not nearly as full as last week at six o'clock. But it's okay, we're here, we'll have a good time. I give some money But hey, let's not get crazy about it. You're not talking about that tithing thing or anything, are you? Let's not get crazy about it. Because we like what we have. And we don't want to rock the boat, do we? Here's here's a, a, a shocking 
fact for you. We like us, don't we? We like us. We look in the mirror and we like us. Maybe we need to lose a few pounds, but we like us. And we like our, our, our life. We like everything about us. We're pretty good people. We don't want to rock the boat. So I'm not going to pray to rock the boat. And God says, what about rocking the boat? You see, we think Jesus was a go-along and get-along kind of guy. He walked up to the Pharisees and he said, Oh, you wonderful religious leaders, you're so special. I just love you. I think you're marvelous. I think you're... No, he said, You're whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Yeah, he was a win friends and influence people kind of guy. He went to the temple and said, Would you please stop cheating the people? Would you please stop selling the animals the way you... No! He went in, he made a whip. Do you know that he made a whip? That's really cool. That's really cool. He made a whip. And he said, I have this whip. No, he started swinging it around. Tipping over tables. Do you, can you imagine the money flying everywhere? Can you imagine what those priests were thinking? Holy cow! He was radical. My Jesus was radical. He did not accept the status quo. So why don't we get big things when we pray? Because we don't pray for big things. We have a church building we're trying to build. How much you've been praying radically about that building? In six months, Lord, I want to see the money in. Oh, that's radical. A year, whatever it might be. Why don't we pray radically? Radical faith. Lord, I'm going to believe that if you need me to move, it's going to all work out exactly the way it's supposed to. That's radical faith. That doesn't mean it's smooth. It's just going to work out exactly the way God wanted, and you have the faith that that's exactly what's happening. What if we had a radical love that said, you know what, you're not as lovely as I'd like you to be. Guess what? Neither am I, neither are you, neither is anybody. What if we had a radical love that says, I'm going to love the way Jesus loved, not the way society tells me. What if we had a radical outreach that said, we're going to do whatever is necessary to reach the people around us? You call me a fool for Christ? Okay. Okay. That's fine. What if we had radical giving? Radical giving that said, I don't know where it's coming from, but this is what you want me to do. Do we not pray radically because we think God isn't going to answer our prayers? No, I think we don't pray radically because we think he might. What am I going to do then? Wow, what am I going to do then? Verses 13 through 17, the writer says back to God that when we are ready for the change God wants to do in our lives, when we're ready to have a pure heart and allow the Holy Spirit to rule our direction, the results will be teaching. Teaching others about God's way. Opening our mouths to praise Him and an understanding that God is not interested in our duty and obligation but he's more interested in a broken spirit and a contrite heart. When he has those, he has the total me, total you, total us. When he has a broken spirit and a contrite heart, he doesn't have to worry about the rest. He, you're his. What would be the result if we prayed for hurting people victims of tragedies, maybe even our enemies. What would happen if we made a searching, fearless inventory of how much more we could be if we asked God for the courage 
to take chances. When you think about the most courageous believers, you know, the ones who seem to have taken faith risks. They've made personal sacrifices for their faith. Do we look at them and say, oh, I'm sorry. No. Even though we may not express it, we admire them. We admire their courage, their faith, their tenacity. All of us as believers can have that something special. The questions we have to ask then, going into the new year, the questions we have to ask ourselves are, will we pray radically? Whatever it might be. Will I tell God I'm ready for whatever you want me to do? And believe me, don't ever pray that until you're ready. Don't ever pray that until you're ready because God says, okay, baby, let's get started. You will see change. Big change, small change, change all over. But as we look at this new year, let's say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever it is you have for me to do. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we know it's so easy to just do what we've always done. Live how we've always lived. Say what we've always said. Yet sometimes you've called us to be that different person for someone around us. You've called us to pray about the big things. To pray about change. To pray about Everything that you find important, not what we find important. Help us, Lord, to flip that on its ear. Help us to know that when we pray to you, it is you who will answer. Lord, help us to be all that we need to be. Help us to be those risk takers in prayer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Communion cups, we'll, if you push down on that tab, that will release it a little bit. You can open up the part that has the bread. It says that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I always find that interesting. Because he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He didn't need to do this for himself. He did not do this for himself. He did that for us. He broke his body for us that we might have salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that your son gave his body that we might find forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would bless in all of this. May we always be grateful for what was done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together. If you open up the top, we get to the juice part. As you're doing that, I, I have always found it interesting where he said, this is my blood. And in many of the versions it said, which is poured out for you, past tense. If you look at the structure of the original, it's really, this is my blood, which is being poured out for you. Meaning on a regular basis, over and over. His blood was poured out that night at Passover. His blood was pouring out during the early church. And his blood is pouring out today to cover sin. What a wonderful thing that is. We have a blood that covers and washes away sin from the time Jesus rose from the dead until he comes again. Father, how can we understand, how can we ever understand your giving your son to die, to shed his blood? Lord, let us always try to be worthy of the sacrifice he made. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together.